Briefly, I would like to look in general at some current trends in higher education and then sum up the major points of the Bologna process and then look at implications of the Bologna process for translating and interpreting. I'm going to base most of what I say on current trends in higher education not on a European Union document at all. I think we sometimes have a tendency in the European Union to think that all documents come from Brussels, all documents are European documents. But I think that there are some other interesting documents on higher education which will uh, also affect what we're doing and in fact which are prior to Bologna and Bologna is not unrelated to them. So if we have a look, and I would recommend that you have a look at the UNESCO Declaration on Higher Education for the 21st Century, Vision and Action, which then leads on to a framework for priority action for change, uh, perhaps that would give us a slightly broader framework in which to look at Bologna. I will do this very briefly because um, we could talk about this document for half an hour before going on to Bologna, and that's not the point of, of the exercise. Um, the UNESCO document reminds us what the core mission of higher education is, or what the core missions in the plural of higher education are. And I think it's important not to lose sight of these when we're working with undergraduate and postgraduate programs whether it be in translator training or in any other field of tertiary education. So to educate, to train, to undertake research, and in particular to contribute to the sustainable development and improvement of society as a whole. And the main issues dealt with in the UNESCO document, again I'm not going to go into detail on all of them because there are a lot of them, would be Okay, accessibility, so accessibility of higher education to higher education for different social groups, the critical and forward-looking function of universities, the relevance of university programs to society at large, insertion of tertiary education into what they call a seamless system that is starting in preschool education, primary, secondary, through tertiary onto postgraduate and lifelong learning. An increasing diversification of models, that is a move away from standard traditional uh, programs where we join in first year, we go right the way through the program, we leave as a graduate and we begin to work and we don't go back to university, but rather that universities should have multiple entry and exit points. Hmm. The entire issue of quality at university, which we were actually discussing in the seminar earlier this evening, um, but quality is a multi-dimensional concept. That is quality in all aspects of university life, services and activity. Staff development, which is a major issue and I think an issue that we will come back to when we come on to translating and interpreting. That is, our staff trained for uh, the role they are currently being asked to fulfill at university and the roles they will be asked to fulfill in the future because it is clearly a changing role. Higher education in this document should be student-centered in all aspects and that is I think an interesting one because it takes in not only training programs and how training programs are organized and run but also other university services, support services and so on. Participation of women, again in translating and interpreting, that's an interesting one. New technologies and equitable access to new technologies. University as a public service. Internationalization of the university and here in particular I think there's a different discourse between the UNESCO document and the Bologna document. The UNESCO document is seriously worried about brain drain and about how internationalization can lead to some areas of the world being left without 
they're highly qualified, well qualified professionals. Recognition, and that's what Anthony and I were just talking about a moment ago, that is higher education should allow for diplomas to be recognized internationally, thereby allowing mobility. And partnership, that is university understood not as a closed system, but as a system where there are, to use the buzzword, a number of stakeholders. And here we have a list of some of these national and institutional policymakers, governments, parliaments, the media, teaching and related staff, researchers, students and their families, the world of work, community groups, and so on. That then is what the UNESCO puts forward, and I haven't, as I said, gone into great detail on what they say on each point, in their document. That's a document from the 1998 conference, World Conference on Higher Education, so it's more or less at the same time as the Bologna process was born. The Bologna process is an unusual European Union process in that it was not actually born in Brussels. It wasn't born in Bologna either. Mm -hmm. But rather, it is a university, by, it's a university initiative. It's an initiative which arose from the academic world itself at a meeting held in La Sorbonne in France in 98, so as I say, same time as the UNESCO document, and then led on to the Bologna Declaration, which was produced in 99, and which is produced in the context as I said, of the university, but in the wider European context, European Union context, of the Lisbon strategy. So when the politicians take on the Bologna Declaration and say, yes, okay, that's what we think we would like to do, it is to a certain extent taken out of the hands of the academics who had some of the original ideas, and it becomes part of the EU drive to become what they call the most competitive knowledge-based economy by the year 2010. And this is one of the points where it's not the same as the UNESCO approach. So internationalization in Bologna does not necessarily mean the same as internationalization when the UNESCO talks about internationalization. The European Union deliberately wants to compete with the United States, for example, as a provider of higher education for the world. Hmm? The current Bologna website, the Bologna website moves around with the EU presidency. The current website is in the UK, and that is the URL, which will be on the PowerPoint presentation, which I think you will have access to later on. So you have it there if you want to have a look at the interminable documents which are produced um, throughout the process. There have been a whole series of pretty much yearly conferences, each with their corresponding declaration each of which says more or less the same as the previous one, and then a number of monitoring documents which say how far we've got on the road to this new European higher education area. There are five or six basic concepts which are key to understanding where European higher education is supposed to be heading under the Bologna process. And I'd just like to run through those in a little bit more detail perhaps than I did previously with the UNESCO document. The first is the issue of transparency. That is that European higher education systems are to be understandable to each other, to the students in them, and to those who might be interested in coming to study in them, and to employers. Um, this would seem to be pretty logical and self-evident, but in fact the situation in higher education in Europe has been that national systems are actually quite radically different from each other, and that it is sometimes very, very difficult for someone who is used to one particular national context, or maybe even two or three national contexts, to understand others. And therefore this transparency is an absolutely key issue. And I'll come back to it because it has an influence on a lot of the other issues um, relating to Bologna. Essentially structures and information, essentially. Perhaps what has most been talked about, certainly in university circles, has been the qualification structure. 
that is, how are university qualifications to be organized under the Bologna Declaration. And this is our famous 3 plus 2 plus 3, which I will explain for those of you who are not familiar with it. Um, three would be the length of time, the number of years, which a typical undergraduate program would last. Two, the number of years which a typical master's program would last. And then that would lead on, for those who wish to do so, to a doctoral thesis, which would notionally last for three years. I say notionally because three years is perhaps quite short, particularly in some of our traditions here, for uh, the actual writing of a doctoral thesis. This has been the major point of debate in Bologna, because of course each European country has its own tradition. The country we are in, Spain, would have a traditional system whereby a full undergraduate program lasted for five years until about 10, 15 years ago when some undergraduate programs reduced the length of time to four. But where you would find a great deal of resistance to lowering the duration of an undergraduate program to three years. Uh, whereas other countries, such as the United Kingdom, fit perfectly well into this structure because standard undergraduate programs in England, at any rate, have traditionally lasted for three years and there has traditionally then been postgraduate provision uh, of one and a half or two years after that. Other countries such as Denmark would have a six-year undergraduate program. So clearly fitting into this is perhaps one of the major issues that the different countries have had to deal with. Mm, coming back to transparency, another key concept is that of the diploma supplement. Although from a comment that uh, Anthony has just made to me, diploma supplements can sometimes cause more problems than they solve. The idea of a diploma supplement is that as well as the actual diploma a student receives on completing any university course, they would also receive um, a piece of paper which would explain in more detail what they have done, in what way, what competences they have achieved, etc., etc., and this would be in the national language and in one of the more widely spoken European languages, I think in most cases, English. Hmm? Other essential elements of the Bologna process. Quality in higher education, which is taken to mean two essential things. One would be evaluation of programs, so constant evaluation of programs in order to achieve accreditation, which in some national systems is what would allow programs to continue or not. Moving on from there, we come to what to me is perhaps the most interesting element of the Bologna process, which is the change in teaching paradigms, the change in learning paradigms in most European university systems from what has been traditionally a teacher-centered or content-centered approach to a student-centered approach. So the emphasis moves from what is taught to what is learned. And this is reflected in how learning is measured in terms of a proportional importance of elements within a course structure. So credit system. Hmm. Um, the idea behind the credit system which has been established is twofold. The first is that it should be transferable and this is in its name, the European Credit Transfer System, ECTS. That is that one credit at any European university will mean the same as one credit at any other European university. And on the other hand, that uh, the credit is to be measured not in traditional terms of content input or face-to-face -face input, but rather in terms of student effort. So a credit is to be 25 to 30 hours of student effort. Clearly this is notional in that there is no real way of actually knowing what each individual student is carrying out as effort 
uh, in order to achieve the credits. But it's certainly a much more flexible and a much more interesting approach to measuring what is happening than the traditional Spanish approach, for example, whereby one credit is 10 hours sitting in a classroom. Okay, other concepts, um, perhaps maybe one of which I will spend some more time on, lifelong learning as in the UNESCO document, that is when one graduates from university and joins the world of work, that is not the end of learning process and so on, but rather uh, there will be a need given the way society is evolving for people constantly to return to university or to other institutions or other centers of learning to receive further training to learn more. The, what the European Union calls the European dimension of higher education. The European dimension is one of these European buzzwords. Um, the idea behind it from the Brussels point of view being that citizens of the European Union should become aware of belonging to some form of supranational uh, entity that is not only national identity but of developing a European identity. And finally, mobility. Mobility is another one of the major aspects of the Bologna process both after graduation, that is the idea is that people with university qualifications will be able to move throughout the European Union without much difficulty, but also during their university education. And in fact, taken to an extreme, it could mean that a student would take each year of their university education at a different institution in a different country, and that this would be fully recognized taken to an extreme and perhaps an unlikely extreme. Okay, what does all of this mean for translator and interpreter training? If we can just take two or three of the points and look at them in more detail. The structures issue. So the whole issue of three plus two um, should allow programs to be designed in a more flexible fashion and should allow for a wider variety of types of program to meet different kinds of needs in different kinds of contexts. Bearing in mind, for example, the issue of prior knowledge on entry. That is, if I can take an example of the issue of prior knowledge, one of the major issues for translator training is what, what is the level of language competence of students who join translator and interpreter training programs. And in many European countries where there are full undergraduate programs in translating and interpreting, there could be serious doubt about whether or not students entering the program really have sufficient language competence to actually be trained, to actually learn, to become translators and interpreters. Um, the 3 plus 2 flexible system should in fact allow that issue to be addressed and should allow um, fairly general language training to take place at the undergraduate level and then for more specialized training to be made available at postgraduate level. Similarly, in countries where students already have substantial language competence on entering undergraduate programs, um, it should be possible to allow for specialization to take place at master's level within translating and interpreting after an undergraduate degree. It would seem, however, on looking at what's happening in, in different European countries, that in actual fact that flexibility is not really being taken up and that on the whole people are clinging to their fairly traditional nat national structures and that there is considerable resistance to change. Um, and if I can just, again, take an example from Spain, which is the situation I know best, in a nationwide project which was carried out two years ago to design the future structure of undergraduate translating and interpreting courses, undergraduate or postgraduate translating and interpreting courses in Spain, 
the vast majority of the existing undergraduate programs wanted to maintain their current four-year structure in both translating and interpreting, thus again missing any opportunity to actually uh, engage with some of the serious problems which undergraduate translating and interpreter training courses have. One of the big, big issues has been why is interpreting compulsory on undergraduate programs, ostensibly training translators? Um, how are specialized interpreters to be trained? But then when it actually comes to analyzing the situation and saying what can we do about this, about 90% of the existing courses said, oh no, we don't want to change. We can't change now. We've been doing this for 10 years. Let's just hang on to what we've got in case things get worse. Okay, so this resistance to change is um, quite sad, really. Uh, but, and seems to happen not only, it's not only the case in Spain, it's happening in other countries also. Hmm? This is all linked in, in the case of translating and interpreting with the situation of general language courses in gen, in, at university level. Um, we would have to link it in with falling recruitment for traditional language and literature courses in some countries with fairly substantial fall off in recruitment for any kind of language study in countries such as the United Kingdom, for example, where translation is being taken on, and this is what happened in Spain 10, 15 years ago as well, as an attractive alternative, and thus is recruiting students who don't really want to be translators and interpreters, um, but just want some sort of attractive linguistic training. These are issues which, as I said, it would seem Spanish courses at any rate are not prepared to actually to engage with. Uh, issues of transparency and quality. I don't want to go into too much detail here, but there are, there are lots and lots of different issues here relating to whether we have undergraduate or postgraduate courses, what's the entry level, and so on. And in particular relating to evaluation and accreditation. Evaluation according to what standards, according to whose standards, accreditation by whom, by national bodies which are higher education bodies but know very little about translating and interpreting, or by translating and interpreting bodies which know very little about national educational contexts. And here there can in fact be quite a lot of conflict of interests. As I said, I'm, I'll not go into much detail on that one, but I think it's something which as a field we should be aware of. And then to come on perhaps to the area that I personally would be most interested in, or which I find at least most positive, forward-looking and optimistic in the entire Bologna process, which is that of teaching and learning. Compared to most other disciplines in most European countries, we do seem to have something of a head start in that translation as a field, translation studies as a discipline, has had a very long-standing interest in training issues and has in fact got fairly interesting research already carried out on outcomes-based learning um, and has a fairly, again, long-standing tradition of links with the profession. Now, I am aware that within translation studies, some of us feel that maybe we should have more links with the profession, that maybe things have not gone far enough. But if we compare our field with other academic disciplines, I think you will find that we are actually relatively well placed for the changes which are to come about. And I'm thinking in particular here of um, interdisciplinary courses which I have participated in where colleagues, for example, from the biology faculty or the biology program would be saying, well, frankly, I have no idea what the objectives of a biology degree are and I have no idea what my graduates do when they leave here and why would I want to know that anyway? Hmm. So if we compare ourselves with that, then I think in translating and interpreting we are streets ahead, we may feel we would like to improve even further, but I think it is important to situate ourselves relative to other disciplines also. 
it is also true that there is a, at least a move towards inductive approaches, student-centered approaches to learning, with two ends of the scale, if you like, from the task-based, very, very, very detailed approaches, personified perhaps by Maria Gonzalez Davis or by Amparo Hurtado and her team in, in Spain, to the project-based, very, very real-life simulation approaches of Guadec, Kirali, Jean Vienne, and so on. It has been suggested that those are actually contradictory educational paradigms. I don't think they are. I think they are um, similar in that they are both inductive, they are both student-centered and constructivist in approach, and can be taken as appropriate at different points in training. That is, task-based task -based approaches are probably much more appropriate in the early t stages of training, whereas real-life project-based approaches are probably more appropriate later on. But, so the downside, where do we still have problems? Where do we still need to improve? And these are only some of the issues that I think are important. One is that in, in no sense is this head start which we have uniform. That is, in some institutions, teaching and learning is very innovative, is very highly developed, is based on a great deal of reflection, analysis, and so on. In other institutions, that is not the case at all. In the issue of resources, this kind of student-based learning requires substantial resources, which not all of our institutions will have, either in terms of staff to deal with the small groups which are necessary, or in terms of, and this was linked to what Belinda will be dealing with, technology. Um, do we really have the technological resources that we need in higher education institutions to provide the, the um, training which professional translators and interpreters will need? I think that's one of the reasons that a lot of the new courses in Spain actually were against removing interpreting from the undergraduate degree it was because they'd actually bought an interpreting lab. So if they did away with interpreting on the undergraduate course, what were they going to do with it? And that was one of the, one of the problems. Still on resources, but on, sorry, let me go back. Um, human resources, which is a horrible term, but teaching staff. Staff development, we saw, is an issue which is dealt with in the UNESCO document. It is not dealt with very clearly in any of the Bologna documents, but is clearly an issue in that teaching staff have not been prepared to work in this new paradigm in any way. And I think one of the very worrying things about the Bologna process is that many members of the teaching staff see it as an imposition from above, from Brussels. You can't get much higher than that, really, I suppose. And many members of the teaching staff are actually quite reticent, don't want to know, are not interested. Bologna in many institutions has become filling in lots and lots of bits of paper. We don't like doing that in general as, as teachers. And, and a lot of the time we're filling in the bits of paper without really knowing why. And this is something which simply won't work in educational reform. If reform is coming in from above without counting on the actual teaching staff and, and students involved, it won't work. It re we really need to take a bottom-up um, approach to this. Uh, staff development is something which in translating and interpreting we have actually worked on a little bit. Perhaps again, a lot of us think less than we should have, but there are uh, courses and initiatives in place to help to train the trainers. So again, perhaps we have something of a head start, although I think still a long way to go. Along with the res resourcing problem, other institutional constraints such as admissions policies and so on, um, 
And while some national contexts have difficulty finding enough students to fill a course, other national contexts have so many students where the, that want to do the course um, that we are absolutely flooded with students. If I can just give an example from my own institution, we are a translating and interpreting faculty with 1,500 students. If we, we are one of the largest, okay, but if we multiply that by 20, just how many translators and interpreters do we really need to train in Spain a year? Are we not doing something here which is radically inadequate, inappropriate, and so on? I think that that is another problem. It's also a problem from a purely teaching and learning point of view in that an institution of that size cannot work with groups of 5, 10, 20 students, but has to work with groups of 50 students. As we've seen in, in the seminar these past three days is actually also the case uh, in other European countries and outside Europe. So again, an institutional constraint which needs to be addressed. And finally, and here this is what we've spent today's seminar talking about, assessment procedures. While quite a lot of work has been done on teaching and learning, quite a lot of general work has been done on teaching and learning, there has been very little work on aligning assessment procedures and assessment practices with teaching and learning practices and design. Um, translation quality is a complex issue in general. The assessment of student performance on translating courses is, is a different issue, a related issue, but it's complex and I feel has not been addressed sufficiently in order really to carry out the kind of new teaching and learning that we are being expected to do. Those are some of the issues relating to teaching and learning. I'd like to look now briefly at some of the issues relating to internationalization and mobility. I don't know how I'm going for time. Am I okay? Um, the very nature of our discipline obviously makes us an international, multinational, intercultural, multicultural uh, discipline and therefore there is a fairly long-standing tradition of international partnership in translating and interpreting with fairly high levels of participation in mobility programs and some very well consolidated international networks. I'm thinking here of just a few examples. SUTI as the longest standing, the European Language Council which has a, a section devoted to translation, and a lot of other smaller networks which are very often ex-inter-university cooperation projects from the Socrates Erasmus program. So internationalization and mobility are not new ideas in translating and interpreting as they are in other fields, but they have some difficulties some problems which I feel have not really been addressed fully and if mobility and internationalization is to increase in the European higher education area they would need to be addressed. The first is that mobility is very often an incidental add-on to national structures. It is very very rarely written into the design of a program and for mobility to work it really needs to be an intentional and integral part of a program. Um, program structure, as I say here, are built on long-standing givens, for example, language combinations. Most translator training courses at undergraduate level, this is not the case of research programs at postgraduate level, are based on very, very fixed language combinations. Mobility undoes all of those language combinations we end up with multilingual classrooms working in all sorts of different directions which calls into question all sorts of givens in translation studies about directionality and so on and so forth. And yet we're still pretending that we're working in one particular language combination. I would suggest that should also be addressed and maybe by changing the way in which we structure training programs. Do we have to structure by language combination? Are there not other ways of doing it? 
staff mobility is still uh, a problem in that teaching staff move a lot less than students. Um, and for true internationalization to take place, staff mobility is an important element. It's obviously harder normally for teaching staff to move, particular for longer, particularly for longer periods of time. Hence the importance of working with what the European Union, which is very good at inventing these little terms, calls virtual mobility. That is not just distance learning, but also other forms of um, mobility whereby the student who doesn't move does actually see a visiting professor who comes in and so on. Um, so using more imaginative forms of internationalizing the, the program. Okay. And I think that is all I wanted to put to you as some initial ideas on the process. Um, there are lots and lots of points that we can go into detail on. So let's take it from there. Okay. Thank you.